Welcome to the Blockchain VC, a podcast about crypto and the digital assets ecosystem. My name is Tomer Federman, and I'm the managing partner at Federman Capital. We invest in the most promising blockchain startups across the globe. I have more than 15 years of experience in tech, and before starting the fund, I was on the product side at Facebook, where I led product strategy and global growth of some of Facebook's major ad products. Previously, I also lived in Silicon Valley for a few years, where I attended Stanford Business School. You can find me on Twitter at Tomer Federman. Before we begin, please note that this podcast is for informational purposes only, and all the opinions expressed on this show, either by guests or me, do not reflect the opinions of Federman Capital. Nothing on the Blockchain VC podcast represents an investment or financial advice. Please, do your own research. Also, If you like this episode of The Blockchain VC and want to help bring more awareness to the space, I'd really appreciate it if you can rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. This only takes a few seconds and helps get the word out. Okay, let's do this. So really excited to welcome to the show today, Zach Prince, CEO of BlockFi. Zach, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Before we dive into BlockFi and what you guys are doing, we'd love to learn more, Zach, about your background and how you got into the crypto space. Sure. So I, um, I grew up as a competitive tennis player in, in Texas, uh, put myself through college as a semi-professional online poker player, uh, which was great because it enabled me to come out of school with, uh, with no debt. Um, And, so you moved from tennis to poker. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I moved from, well, I started playing in high school, you know, just like uh, friend, guy friends once a week having a little poker game. And um, uh, it was around the time where they started showing poker on TV in the U.S. And uh, financial companies were just sending money to poker websites. Uh, and it was kind of uh, a big, like, boom that happened in that industry. Um, so, you know, it, it was fun for a while. On the one hand... Uh, I made, you know, decent money that enabled me to just pay for school myself and not need loans or, you know, support from my parents. Uh, but on the other hand, I was a 19 year old, uh, you know, ma making real money pretty quickly. <laughs> so, uh, in hindsight, maybe I had a bit too much fun sometimes. Um, but, uh, but it, but it was great. And <laughs> po po poker teaches you, uh, some, some really, uh, fantastic, uh, lessons about, um, risk management and uh, thinking opportunistically and, and strategy. And um, so it was, it was a great, uh, it was a great experience. And after college, I uh, uh, got a job in uh, New York at a startup technology company. I always thought that I would work in finance growing up, but I graduated in May of 2009, smack dab in the middle of, uh, you know, the financial uh, meltdown. And I ended up getting a job at an advertising technology company. It was a company called AdMeld, and uh, it, it went really well. So that, that kind of um, first experience at that company uh, made me realize how much I loved uh, being a part of uh, you know, high-growth startups, small teams, building things. Uh, that company, that first company was ultimately very successful. I was there for about three years, and then we got acquired by Google. I spent a little bit of time at Google and uh, left Google with some of my colleagues from AdMeld and started the North American entity for a German-based ad tech startup. That grew really quickly, and it was acquired about two years after we started it in North America. And then more recently and more relevantly for BlockFi, uh, I've uh, worked in the online lending sector uh, for about seven years uh, prior to starting BlockFi um, at two different companies, one which was a aggregator of data and a technology solutions provider to institutional investors who were buying loans or lending directly to all of the largest online lending companies like Lending Club and SoFi and Funding Circle, Zopa, et cetera. And uh, I also spent a little bit of time at a point of sale consumer lender. Um, and while I was at uh, the first of those two companies, the one where we aggregated uh, information about online lenders, I started writing a blog on the side because I kind of became the fintech guy amongst my friend group. And uh, I was getting exposure to all these really cool companies. And my friends were asking me, you know, should I 
invest in commercial real estate on this platform or should I use a robo advisor? And uh, I decided to just start writing about all this stuff. This is in like 2014 um, and writing about it uh, and, and researching different things that were happening in the fintech space is what originally led me to Bitcoin. And uh, I invested in Bitcoin for the first time in 2014 and I was writing about it on this blog and um, you know, I invested. Why did you, why did you invest in it? What did you see back then that convinced you to make that leap of faith? Well, a couple of different things. So, you know, the, the first thing was that um, uh, it was after one of the pullbacks. So, you know, Bitcoin had run up to like a thousand dollars and retraced to around 350. So uh, it looked interesting from a um, just risk adjusted returns perspective. It's already touched a thousand. Um, it's, uh, you know, this new thing that probably has kind of a venture capital type return profile. It could go up, you know, 10 X or hundred X from here. It could also go to zero, but you know, I, I was kind of comfortable with that level of risk. That was one thing. And the second thing was just, I was so fascinated by it. You know, one of the things that you learn being in the FinTech sector is that, uh, in the financial sector generally is that there's not that many things that are completely new under the sun, you know, like this online lending industry that had a big boom. Uh, at the end of the day, these companies weren't building entirely new products. They were just uh, taking things that, you know, banks had done for a long time and making them easier, making them digital, mm -hmm. uh, making them more, you know, consumer friendly in, in some ways. Uh, but, but there wasn't anything fundamentally new about it. Uh, whereas with Bitcoin, this is an entirely new concept, right? It's a, it's a breakthrough in uh, computer science. It's a, a decentralized payment network where you can move money around the world and uh, no, no bank can, can stop you or no, no government can stop the network from running. Um, you know, what is Bitcoin uh, from an investment perspective? Is it a security or a commodity or digital gold? And, it just felt like there was so much uh, potential there and that it actually was something completely new, uh, which, which is exciting. So uh, for, for all those reasons, I was, you know, just basically telling everybody who was reading my blog back in 2014 that they needed to download the Coinbase app and at least buy a little bit of, uh, of Bitcoin. It's amazing that you saw the potential that early. Few did. And why did you always think you're going to go into finance? Uh, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not really sure. I guess it was some combination of nature and nurture. I mean, I was always um, coming up with, uh, you know, entrepreneurial types of endeavors as a kid, selling candy on the bus, you know, that kind of stuff. And I was asking my parents uh, to buy me stocks for Christmas instead of toys when I was like 10 years old. Um, I, I always really liked math and, and numbers. Uh, so... I was just always uh, attracted to it um, and uh, enjoyed thinking about it. Uh, so basically because of that you know, interest, I, I always anticipated that uh, I would find my way into the financial industry professionally. Got it. And then when did you start BlockFi? And if you can talk a bit about how did that come about? Yeah, so, so I was you know, buying Bitcoin and recommending it in 2014. Uh, and then in 2016, I learned about Ethereum and I made this uh, analogy in my head that Ethereum was kind of like an iPhone and Bitcoin was kind of like a BlackBerry. And, you know, the iPhone is going to be way bigger than the BlackBerry. And so uh, this is before Ethereum was even on Coinbase. I you know, took some Bitcoin off of Coinbase, sent it to Shapeshift, bought some Ethereum, held it in a wallet. And the whole thing was just, you know, m mind blowing to me that this was actually happening. Um, but but I invested in I invested in Ethereum pretty early, and then uh, for like six months it was it was down fifty percent, and I thought I was a total uh, idiot. Um, and uh, but then then the price started going up. So late, uh, you know, back half of twenty sixteen, uh, the price of Ethereum started uh, increasing. Uh, because the price was increasing, you know, for both Bitcoin and Ethereum, I was getting increasingly interested in it. I was talking about it a lot at home. And at a certain point, my wife said, you know, you're, you're talking to me about cryptocurrency a lot. And, uh, 
I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> so you should go. <laughs> you should go. That sounds familiar. You, you should go make some, uh, you know, some cryptocurrency friends. Um, and uh, so I started going to meetups in New York City in, in the back half of 2016. And, you know, originally the meetups were pretty small. It was, uh, you know, er early adopters who were uh, attending um, computer scientists, libertarians, uh, you know, so some of the folks that were, you know, in, in really early. Um, and then early 2017, the composition of those meetups in New York started to change. And you started to see a lot of uh, venture capitalists, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, folks who, you know, left their job on Wall Street, still wearing a suit and tie coming to these meetups. And there would be a meetup that, uh, you know, had an event space big enough for 100 people and like 300 people would show up. And so there was, uh, you know, just a lot of excitement. Um, and I started thinking, uh, wow, this this could really uh, go mainstream. Um, we, we could be at the beginning of, uh, something that that's really going to, uh, be, be very big. Um, and at that point I started thinking about, uh, trying to get involved in the space full time. And I actually had an experience, uh, with a bank in Texas where I was trying to, uh, buy an investment property in Texas and, uh, this Bitcoin and Ethereum that I had, the price was going up. And so it was, uh, you know, it was, a uh, material, position just in terms of my personal assets. And I thought, okay, I'm applying for a loan with the bank. Let, let's see what they say uh, about Bitcoin and Ethereum. And so I listed them on my, <laughs> I listed them on my financial statement that I uh, submitted to the bank. And, and not only did they say, you know, we, we don't think these assets are actually worth anything. You know, we're not giving you credit in terms of our uh, underwriting uh, for any value in those assets, but they also put me through a little bit of a ringer with their compliance team because, uh, oh, you know, they were, we're worried you might be involved in some illicit activities because you own Bitcoin. And uh, that, that was my, you know, kind of light bulb moment uh, for, for the uh, idea, original idea of BlockFi, which was um, this asset class is going to get bigger. Uh, and just like every other asset class, there's going to be a need for lending for debt and credit products. And banks aren't going to touch it anytime soon. So uh, there, there's probably um, an opportunity there. And uh, then in the summer of 2017, I uh, partnered up with uh, my co-founder, Flory, who I had worked with uh, previously. And uh, we, we started a company behind that idea. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about BlockFi. What is BlockFi? And I know also your product offering obviously has expanded quite a bit more recently. Would love to learn more about that. Yeah, so you know, today we uh, the primary word we use to describe ourselves is a, a wealth management platform for crypto investors. Uh, we have a few different um, products that are in market, and we have a few different uh, you know components of our business that exist today, and we're also uh, still in the product uh, development process as a company, and we'll be launching new products in the future. Um, today, there are uh, three core products that we have that you can access, uh, you know, via our, uh, web application. Uh, the first one is the ability to borrow dollars secured by your cryptocurrency as collateral. So crypto backed loans, we launched that product in January of 2018. Uh, the second is, uh, the BlockFi interest account. It enables you to, uh, earn interest on your cryptocurrency and stablecoin holdings. We launched that in March of 2019. Uh, and the third one, which we launched in December, is a, a, a trading product. So you can um, trade cryptocurrencies. Uh, it's kind of like a, a brokerage model where we aggregate institutional liquidity and, and uh, don't charge any fees. And we just offer uh, great prices that you can uh, you know, trade against uh, instantly and seamlessly. Um, so those are the three products that we have in market today for uh, you know, folks that are just directly accessing our, our platform on the web. And then there's, uh, things that we do in the institutional market to facilitate the delivery of those products. So specifically for just to clarify, sorry for yeah. uh, cutting you off. Everything no you just described is for uh, retail clients, retail, corporate, and, 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 uh, smaller institutional, but our, our core client for those products is primarily, uh, retail today. Got it. And then you were saying you're also developing or have already developed an offering for institutional investors. 
Yeah, correct. So specifically on the uh, the interest account product um, where you can hold Bitcoin with BlockFi and earn 6% interest on it in Bitcoin, we generate the interest that we're paying to depositors by lending Bitcoin to institutional borrowers. Uh, so we've done a bit of uh, productization on uh, that side as well, where uh, large market making or proprietary trading institutions that are active in the crypto market um, have an ability to uh, you know, borrow cryptocurrency from BlockFi, uh, borrow dollars from BlockFi, um, and uh, that they have kind of a different set of tools and a different team that they uh, interact with within BlockFi. Um, and that's, uh, that's the stuff we have on the platform now. And, and fortunately, it's all been very well received by the market. So launching, you know, the first product in January of 2018 and uh, obviously going through what was a, a rough year for crypto prices uh, in that first year. Um, we, we've grown, uh, you know, pretty tremendously uh, over uh, the last two years. We've got tens of thousands of, uh, you know, clients that are um, using our products. We have uh, uh almost uh, half a billion dollars in assets on the platform now. We're paying out a million dollars a month in interest, and we've been able to attract uh, support from some of the you know, best and smartest investors, not only in the cryptocurrency sector, but also in the, in the fintech sector more broadly. So um, mm-hmm. it's, been, uh, it's been a really awesome journey so far, and, and we, we have some cool stuff still in the pipeline. So it's... Uh, we're we're very, we're very bullish for this year. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think all of us in the space uh, tend to be pretty bullish about the market in general, right? I think many of us would agree. We've only probably started scratching the surface in terms of both what's possible and also just the size of the market. How do you think about setting yourself apart? Because obviously, there's a big opportunity in lending and borrowing. And as you said, we've seen tremendous growth there. We've also seen some other major players enter the market, right, like Compound and so forth. How do you think about distinguishing your offering from what anyone else is doing right now? Yeah, great question. So we think um, regardless of what kind of uh, financial services or fintech or crypto company uh, you're operating, there's a couple different ways that you can try and differentiate. Uh, You can differentiate on price. You can differentiate on client service, which, you know, starts with marketing and and ends with, uh, you know, what happens when someone leaves your platform if they decide to do that. Um, And you can differentiate on uh, products. And uh, for that product piece, there's a a kind of tried and tried and true strategy of building stickiness with a client base, which you do by uh, having a diversity of products available on your platform and, um, uh, ideally, from the company's perspective, uh, getting folks who are clients to use as many of those products uh, as you can uh, and building a sticky relationship with them. And we've tried to uh, we've tried to differentiate ourselves across uh, all of those spheres. So from a rates perspective, uh, we you know believe that we're kind of constantly offering the best rates in the market, both, uh, in terms of the lowest rates to borrow dollars and also in terms of uh, the rates that uh, you earn interest on for stable coins and crypto. Uh, on, the, on the client service side of things, we are one of the few places in crypto where there's a, you know, a phone number on our website that you can call during, uh, during normal business hours and talk to someone in the U.S. who's uh, you know, very smart and, and knowledgeable about uh, everything that we're doing and also the market more broadly. And then lastly, on the product side, you know, we started 2019 with one product. We have three now. Uh, we'll, we'll end 2020 with, with four products in market. And so we, um, you know, we've been first movers a couple times, bringing new products and services into the market. Uh, we think we'll be able to do that at, at least once more, uh, maybe twice more. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, every time we do that, uh, not only are we adding more value for our clients because... Uh, we're bringing products to the market that um, uh, that they want to use, uh, but also we're helping to build differentiation and uh, a bit of defensibility around our business model relative uh, to the competition. 
Yeah, makes sense. And I think the customer service component that you just touched on is huge, especially when you think about the institutional market for sure, uh, but also for retail. How do you offer such competitive rates? What's the, can you share what's the secret there? How can you offer, say, better rates than some of the other competitors? Sure. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's one part function of uh, market pen- penetration and risk management. So, you know, not to pick on them specifically, but you mentioned compound uh, in your question. Um, compound uh, is a, a DeFi platform. They uh, don't do KYC on their customers. Um, and as a result, uh, it's really hard for institutional investors uh, or just institutions generally to get comfortable interacting uh, with their platform uh, because uh, they have regulatory and compliance requirements on them and uh, they can't take the risk of you know not knowing who they're transacting with. Um, BlockFi uh, has kind of put compliance first since the early days. So you know we have uh, an MSB, license at the federal level. We have lending licenses at the state level and money transmission licenses at the state level. Uh, And that focus on compliance has enabled us to uh, transact with institutions who uh, are the primary market for borrowing cryptocurrency. Um, Institutions are also the primary market for us to access lending capital. um, And by more effectively uh, tapping those those markets, uh, institutions borrowing and, and institutions uh, providing us with lending capital, um, we're able to uh, you know keep our rates very competitive. So uh, I think that's the primary component. Um, there's a secondary component though, uh, which is also interesting, which is um, the uh, that stickiness and product differentiation uh, piece that we were just talking about. So. Uh, as we continue to uh, build out more and more products on our platform, we don't need to make as much money on any one single product. So, you know, for example, if you're only in the business of uh, paying interest uh, to depositors and and, uh, lending to borrowers, then the lifetime value of, you know, any one single customer to you uh, is going to be constrained by the fact that uh, you can only offer one product to them. Um, as you increase the number of products that you can offer to each discrete customer, uh, the lifetime value of each customer goes up and the margin that you need to uh, make as a company for each product uh, that you have goes down. So uh, those two factors together, effectively tapping the market and and having a a benefit of uh, the diversified product suite, um, which has a positive impact on uh, each customer's lifetime value uh, for BlockFi, are, I think, are the, the two primary reasons that uh, we're able to offer the best rates. That makes sense. I think oftentimes you see in tech that size advantage that you're talking about, right? And not I'm not talking even in blockchain or in crypto, just in general. When you get to a certain size, you already have the customers. If they like your product, you know, it's sticky, they come back. You can, over time, increase your suite of products and kind of start addressing other pain points that they're experiencing. And the customer acquisition cost is much lower than if you had to acquire new customers from scratch. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, it's a tried and true playbook. We're not uh, reinventing the wheel in terms of the business strategy. Uh, You just have to be really good at execution. Um, And uh, if you can, if you can become a market leader in whatever market you're in, in terms of size, then there's, you know, uh, tremendous benefits that, that come with that. Yeah, exactly. How do you get customers? Can you talk a bit about your customer acquisition strategy? The reason I'm asking is oftentimes when talking with entrepreneurs, I see them building great tech, but they struggle to really get adoption or any significant adoption, right? And it's fairly easy to see. I mean, even some of the leading dApps, right? They have maybe hundreds of users a day which is tiny in the traditional tech space, right? If you, if you had an app and you only had like 200 people using it, you would probably struggle to tell a really compelling story to investors. But I feel like in the crypto space, oftentimes there's a lot of emphasis at this point on the technology. 
and maybe not as much on the importance of customer acquisition and marketing and being effective there. Seems like you guys have cracked that. Would love to hear maybe some of the best practices or the learnings that you had from going BlockFi so far to some of the impressive numbers you mentioned earlier. So, you know, marketing and customer acquisition has been a, a big focus uh, for us from, from day one. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest area where we acquire customers today is from uh, refer a friend, uh, a general referrals bucket, which is uh, refer a friend, word of mouth, uh, and affiliate marketing. Um, and, you know, we have good compensation schemes for people referring folks to us. We uh, try to make that really easy and provide tools in our product for you to, you know, tweet about BlockFi or do other things. Um, and, uh, so that's worked really well. Uh, the second area where we've, uh, invested really heavily is on, uh, different types of search marketing. Um, initially, uh, SEO, which is like organic search, but, uh, increasingly SEM as well. Um, and that was an opportunity for us because we were, targeting something that didn't really exist before, you know, Bitcoin lending, earn interest on your Bitcoin. Uh, these weren't search terms that were heavily competitive uh, when we initially started investing in them. Uh, so it was a great place to... The first mover advantage. Yeah, it was a great place to plant some flags. Um, and then the last thing that, uh, you know, that we've done is just some kind of like direct brand advertising uh, with, a, with a special focus on podcasts, actually. So that, that's the stuff we focused on to date. Um, but our, you know, like our marketing roadmap uh, is pretty aggressive for this year. You know, we're going to go from spending uh, a certain amount per month last year and we're going to like 10x that this year. So there's going to be a lot more things. Oh, wow. There's going to be a lot more things that we're that we're starting to do that we weren't doing before, but uh, you know those are the things that we've focused on historically. Interesting. And what has been the feedback from specifically? I'm curious about the feedback from institutional investors because there's this narrative that all of us in the industry keep hearing about the institutions or the institutional investors are coming, and I think to a large degree you can argue they have already arrived. What are your thoughts about where we are on that uh, spectrum? Yeah, so, you know, I, I agree with the sentiment that uh, institutional investors are already here. I also think it's accurate to say that uh, more of them are uh, coming. Um, the, you know, there's not, there's not just one type of institutional investor or one type of financial institution. There's a lot of different types. Um, and so... Uh, Family offices are generally, regardless of the asset class, some of the first movers, at least uh, family offices that are interested in uh, certain asset classes. Um, in the crypto space specifically, uh, proprietary trading firms and market makers started to get heavily involved uh, in the asset class uh, when volumes picked up in, in 2017, and especially after uh, there was a regulated uh, futures market with the CME. Um, Right now, what we're seeing is that uh, Bitcoin especially is uh, increasingly viewed as part of the conversation for macro hedge funds. Uh, so, you know, that's firms like uh, Paul Tudor Jones, um, Bridgewater, uh, you know, macro type trading strategies. Um, and kind of all along the way, uh, venture capital and, and private equity asset managers uh, like Morgan Creek Digital or Pantera Capital, uh, they've continued to raise money from uh, LPs uh, that are, uh, you know, more and more impressive uh, uh, institutional LPs, whether it's university endowments or, uh, you know, pension funds. Um, and uh, for that part of it, uh, the allocations to, uh, you know, private asset managers, um, and also just in general for, you know, kind of like long only, uh, really big institutional, uh, investment firms, we're still in the early days. So, uh, there are institutions that are already here. I think things like, um, CME and, and, you know, having a, a regulated, uh, derivatives venue, I think things like fidelity supporting, uh, custody and, um, you know, the, the transaction of, uh, Bitcoin on, on their platform is, is huge. And, uh, those are just 
a couple things uh, that are that are happening to progress uh, adoption on the institutional side. And we've, um, you know, from the first conversations we had back in 2017 uh, to today, we've we've seen a massive shift in the level of uh, understanding that institutions have uh, in their level of interest uh, in how they think certain things should be priced relative to their risk. Um, so we're making great progress. Um, people just have to keep in mind that, uh, you know, big, large institutional investors don't move quickly and it all, uh, it, it all operates on a spectrum based on, you know, the, the type of investment firm that they are. Uh, and I think we'll continue to see exciting stuff uh, happen there, but there was never going to be a silver bullet, um, it's not like uh, all of a sudden one day every institutional investor is now allocating to Bitcoin. These things, uh, uh, they take time. Yeah, absolutely. It's a process. What are some of the pushbacks that you're getting when you're trying to sell clients on the notion of crypto? Where do you see the biggest gaps right now for the market as a whole? So I, I think, um, uh, it, it, again, it depends on who you're talking to, but uh it's, it's shifted a little bit for us from, you know, talking to folks who don't even understand, you know, the basics about how it works and, and what it is. Uh, that was, you know, two, two and a half years ago um, to uh, starting to think about, you know, uh, the why and how uh, maybe over the last six to 18 months. And uh, today uh, people are increasingly thinking about, um, sizing, right? So if you, if you understand the baseline and if you understand why and how you could, uh, participate in the asset class, um, now we're starting to see firms start to think about, well, okay, how much should we do? You know, if we manage, uh, a billion dollars, should we be allocating, uh, 10 million or 50 million or, uh, you know, some other amount. So the, the conversation has certainly evolved. Um, and having great solutions for folks in terms of custody, in terms of insurance, in terms of uh, names that they're familiar with, like Fidelity and the CME offering uh, products in the asset class is, uh, is a huge help. Yeah, for sure. How much time do you still spend um, educating clients about crypto? Or is it not so much about that anymore and you kind of focus more on the ones who get the value pop but aren't sure how to get the right exposure? Uh, it's a mix. Um, I, I would say, you know, me personally, like my day to day is, uh, spent less now with, uh, firms that are trying to understand it and more with firms, uh, that are already in or, you know, very, very close to getting in. Um, but we have, you know, other folks on our team who, uh, are focused more on that, you know, earlier stage part of the pipeline. Makes sense. And then how do you think, Zach, about the evolution of lending within the crypto space? Can you talk a bit more about why lending is such a core component of the whole ecosystem? Sure. So um, it's been an area that's, uh, you know, grown uh, very quickly um, for all the same reasons uh, that lending is uh, a critical part of, you know, healthy, uh, robust markets and other asset classes. Um the, all of the same things are true in the crypto space. So, uh, you know, being able to uh, pledge an asset as collateral to access liquidity um, is, you know, a, a critical function for uh, financial assets to have. Uh, being able to earn a yield on an asset uh, is an incredible utility that uh, helps increase the, uh, you know, the value of the asset. Um and then for certain functions in the market to work well, uh, you need access uh, to be able to borrow. So um, I'll give you an example on the institutional side. So let's say you're a firm like uh, Susquehanna. The way, the way you make money is by providing liquidity into uh, financial markets. Um, and normally when you go to start trading a new market, let's say you're going to start trading uh, you know, commodities in Asia, um, you'll, uh, find a few people on your team. You say, you're going to go start trading commodities in Asia. You'll give them uh, 10 million bucks or 50 million bucks. 
and they'll take that. Uh, they'll talk with their prime broker and the prime broker will give them five, maybe 10 X leverage on that capital. So they'll actually be trading, uh, you know, a hundred million to 500 million. Um, and they'll start trading the market and they'll, you know, uh, sell for a nickel and, and, uh, buy for four cents and, and get paid. Um, in the crypto market, there's a few things that are fundamentally different, which drive the demand for institutions uh, uh, to borrow. Um, one is that that traditional prime broker probably isn't going to offer you financing for the cryptocurrency trading part of your business. Uh, the second is that the crypto market structure today doesn't have a single consolidated venue where all of the trading activity takes place. The trading activity takes place, uh, you know, across uh, multiple different exchanges. Right, it's fragmented. Yeah, it's very fragmented, and in order to effectively trade the market, you have to go put money at each one of those uh, different venues. Right, um, and and so as a result, uh, you know, there's a, a, a strong demand to be able to borrow that isn't being met uh, from. Uh, the you know traditional providers of, of that type of service, which you know on the retail side would be a bank, and on the institutional side would be uh, the the prime brokerage division within a bank. Right, makes sense. How do you determine the right amount or the right proportion of collateral? Because one of the things I noticed about the space right now, it doesn't seem to be very efficient from a collateral perspective. Right, on some of these platforms, you see two x, three x, even five x of collateral for whatever it is that you're uh, aiming to get. Most of it is probably just because of the space being so nascent, as we talked about earlier. How do you think about that? And how do you think about the right collateral to ask for from clients? Yeah, so there's, um, you know, there's, there's quite a lot that goes into it, actually. And we could spend a whole hour just uh, talking about uh, the, the different components of risk management and how we set those levels. But um, the, the two core inputs are, uh, the, uh, volatility and liquidity profile of the asset that we're lending against, um, and the characteristics of the, of the counterparty that we're lending to. So, uh, for example, what type of business is the counterparty in, uh, what's their equity position, kind of like, you know, traditional credit type metrics, um. And uh, you basically have to understand all of those things and then make decisions uh, on an asset by asset basis um, and on a counterparty by counterparty basis on the institutional side. Um, fortunately, you know, for us, we, we built our risk management system to, uh, you know, manage these various lending positions after we've uh, entered into them specifically for the cryptocurrency industry. And, uh, it's been running now for over two years and it's performed perfectly throughout its entire history. So, uh, you know, to date we've, uh, never, never lost a penny across, uh, any of the different lending that we do. And we think that that's the way that it should work. We think that, uh, the, the type of lending that we're doing in cryptocurrency is analogous to securities lending in the traditional markets. And, um, uh, in general, that's one of the lowest risk types of lending that, uh, that exists out there. Uh, our chief risk officer spent 15 years as a managing director of prime brokerage at, uh, BAML prior to becoming our chief risk officer. And, uh, throughout his entire history there, including, uh, 2008 and 2009, uh, they never lost money <laughs> lending in their side of the business. So, um, there's a lot that goes into it, but that's a, that's a high level summary. Am I right in the basic premise that right now it's it's way above what we can expect it to be, say, in a few years' time, if the market continues to grow and evolve? It depends on uh, what type of lending you're talking about. So uh, when we're making, for example, a U.S. dollar loan to a retail borrower secured by their cryptocurrency, uh, the maximum initial loan-to-value ratio is 50%, meaning... If someone that has $100,000 worth of Bitcoin, they can borrow up to half that value secured by their $100,000 worth of uh, Bitcoin. Um, I don't think that will change too much. Uh, there are you know, regulatory 
uh, requirements in the U.S. market that govern um, this type of lending. And uh, there might not be specific rules for cryptocurrency yet, but uh, you can kind of, you know, compare it to securities lending, where if you have a portfolio of uh, stocks and bonds, you can borrow up to 50% of that value uh, with a margin loan. So I don't know that the retail side will change that much. Um, on the institutional side, you already we, we already at BlockFi see a, a full spectrum of collateralization ratios and, and margin requirements, depending on who the counterparty is. So for example, if we're lending to uh, a cryptocurrency trading hedge fund that has, you know, $50 million that they're managing. Um, we might require that they post uh, uh, 140% initial collateral. So they have to give us $1.4 million in order to borrow $1 million worth of Bitcoin. We also might uh, be working with someone that's a, you know, large regulated financial institution that has north of a billion dollars in equity, uh, where only, you know, less than 5% of their business is cryptocurrency. And if they want to borrow $5 million of Bitcoin, we might not require that they give us any collateral. So we're already pretty sophisticated in terms of how we uh, manage it at BlockFi and what the range of different LTVs uh, there are. Um, so yeah, we'll see, I guess, you know, like for DeFi, I, I don't know if DeFi is ever going to go unsecured. Uh, that would be, that would be a total disaster in my opinion. Um, yeah. Between like five X or three X collateral to no collateral. I think there's a big gap there. And what's next for you guys? Like I saw somewhere that you mentioned that this year you want to focus more also on first time buyers and people who are new to the crypto space and not just necessarily people who are already in the space and have uh, purchased crypto assets before. Can you share more about what's next for you guys? What's on the roadmap? I think you mentioned earlier also there's a fourth product you're about uh, to roll out soon. I don't know if you're in a position to share more about that. Yeah, we can certainly talk about it. So, um, you know, fundamentally, uh, up until we launched our trading product, uh, we only had products for people that already own cryptocurrency. You're not going to get a loan secured by your crypto or, you know, earn interest on your Bitcoin if you don't already have some. Um, with the trading product, uh, which is uh, a big focus uh, for us uh, in the first half of the year, evolving it a little bit, um, we're going to have a full fiat on an off ramp and you're going to be able to access all of our products via a mobile app. And then also with the other product that we're launching this year, which is a Bitcoin rewards credit card. Uh, where you get cash back on each purchase that you make in the card in Bitcoin instead of you know airline miles or normal cash back. We think that both of those products give us the opportunity to market to customers that don't own cryptocurrency yet. So uh, we're making a you know a shift in terms of uh, our addressable market where we can be the first place that uh, someone owns Bitcoin, and we're you know really excited about uh, that that shift happening for us as a as a company. Um, so th those are the biggest things, uh, that we're focused on and we've got to, you know, grow the team, uh, bring, uh, bring new, uh, you know, new team members on and, um, continue executing to hit the aggressive targets that we have for the success of those products. Sounds like there's a lot ahead of you. And do you expect also to increase the range of, um, crypto assets that you support? I know... Uh, when was it like last week you announced support for uh, the USD coin and Litecoin? Do you expect that to extend that even further to other coins? Or do you think you're going to double down on the major ones and uh, develop additional functionality there? Yeah, so I think we'll definitely be supporting additional coins. Uh, we're, we're very bullish on regulated stable coins. Uh, so we'll definitely be adding more. Uh, you know, stable coins where uh, the entity issuing the stable coin is domiciled in the U.S. and the stable coin is one to one backed by dollars in a bank account. Um, we'll we'll probably also be supporting additional cryptocurrencies, although we don't have anything uh, definitive to say on that front yet. And we're uh, you know really careful about taking risk there in terms of supporting assets that might be securities or uh, you know just just wanting to put things on the platform that are um, value add uh, for our clients in the industry. So 
uh, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be adding uh, new assets. And the launch of USDC and Litecoin was really successful. So um, it's something that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll continue on as a theme this year. Got it. So I'd like to shift gears a bit, uh, Zach, and talk about the market more broadly and kind of get your take on that. What are you most excited about beyond, obviously, BlockFi? Any particular development or projects that you're excited about and are monitoring? Um, well, I'm really bullish on the Bitcoin price. So I think that uh, I think that the price of Bitcoin is going to be a lot, a lot higher at the end of this year uh, than it was at the beginning of the year. Um, the other thing that I'm excited about is uh, just I- increasing institutional and retail adoption uh, driven by uh, new product developments. So the CME re- recently launched options trading. Uh, Fidelity is adding, you know, new features and functionality to their custodial platform. Um, and, uh, I think we'll see a trend of, you know, other, uh, traditional institutional players building products for, uh, the crypto market this year. Um, on the retail side, I think there's two, uh, really exciting trends. One is traditional fintech companies supporting crypto on their platform. So, uh, last year, Robinhood, SoFi, Square, uh, all started doing things in the sector. I think you'll see more uh, traditional fintech companies in the U.S. market and in other markets uh, adding crypto to their platform. Um, and I also think you'll see uh, cryptocurrency uh, get integrated with uh, traditional uh, rewards constructs. So there's a company, Lolly. Uh, there's a company, Pay, FoldApp. Um, the BlockFi Bitcoin rewards credit card. I think that those use cases are really exciting, really uh, compelling from a consumer value proposition perspective. Um, And I I think that they'll help to create this kind of constant buying pressure on the market, which uh, will be one of the, you know, driving factors in uh, the price performance, uh, which I expect to be really great. Yeah. And what about DeFi? What's your take there? I'm excited about it. I think it's uh I think it's really cool that anyone from anywhere in the world uh can access these uh platforms. Um I think that, you know, DeFi today, like I don't know if people include like uh decentralized exchanges when they say DeFi or if they if it's really more like the Yeah, I think it's part of it. Yeah. So look, I think there's use cases there. I think it's always going to be a fraction of the size of uh, centralized players. So um, I don't think we're going to see a decentralized exchange start to get anywhere near the size of uh, traditional centralized exchanges. I don't think we're going to see a decentralized lender uh, get anywhere near the size of uh, traditional centralized lending businesses in the in the space. Why is that, Zach? Just because it's so different from what investors are used to? There's some uh, there's some inefficiencies uh, created with the model, right? So, like, um, you know, building something on Ethereum uh, means that it's slow. There's gas. You have to be really careful anytime you release something and make sure that it's perfect. Otherwise, you know, the entire thing could get hacked or, or not work. Um, it's really hard to get uh, institutional participation, like real institutional participation. And if you don't have institutional participation, then you can't scale that much and you can't offer the best rates. Um, and yeah, I guess mainly those two reasons. I'm a huge fan of DeFi. I like it. I think it's awesome. I think it's, uh, I think it's, you know, it, it's really great for certain things. I just, I just don't think it's going to scale the same way uh, centralized companies with the same core value proposition uh, are going to scale. And the rates aren't as good, right? Like uh, earning interest on your Bitcoin on DeFi, you earn less than 1%. On BlockFi, you earn 6%. On Ethereum, it's really hard to earn any interest on DeFi. It's like maybe point oh five percent like five basis points a year on block five it's 4.1 percent so you know at the end of the day these are financial products and you have to compete on rate at least a little bit um and uh i think DeFi will struggle there versus centralized competitors so last question zach before we end what's your view on the regulatory landscape particularly in the u.s 
There's been a lot of talk about that more recently, certainly since Facebook made the Libra announcement. Curious if you're optimistic about the U.S. becoming more crypto-friendly from a regulatory perspective, or do you think it's a real threat for the industry and we're going to see perhaps more companies like Circle, for instance, moving some of their operations overseas? Uh, I think it's going to be you know, business as usual. Uh, in the U.S. market from a regulatory perspective. I don't think a lot's going to change in 2020. Um, I think that, uh, you know, BlockFi has somewhat of a unique view on the regulatory side of things because we kind of came into it eyes wide open having worked in fintech and we never expected that we would be able to, you know, make loans without a lending license or move money around without an MSB license. Um, So... I, I actually think the U.S. has been, you know, relatively okay <laughs> uh, in terms of the regulations, um, and I, I'm not betting on. Uh, I, I wouldn't bet on anything major happening in 2020, either good or bad, in terms of uh, the regulatory structure in the U.S. Got it. So you think more of the same. Really enjoyed the discussion, and congrats on all the progress you guys have been making, and appreciate you taking the time to share your insights. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening. If you like this episode of The Blockchain VC and want to help bring more awareness to the space, I'd really appreciate it if you can rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. This only takes a few seconds and helps get the word out.